Chapter Two of the Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two. The storm raged fiercely all that night, but nothing of particular note occurred. The next morning, however, when they came down to breakfast, they found the terrible stain of blood once again on the floor. I don't think it can be the fault of the Paragon detergent, said Washington, for I have tried it with everything. It must be the ghost. He accordingly rubbed out the stain a second time, but the second morning it appeared again. The third morning also it was there, though the library had been locked up at night by Mr. Otis himself, and the key carried upstairs. The whole family were now quite interested. Mr. Otis began to suspect that he had been too dogmatic in his denial of the existence of ghosts. Mrs. Otis expressed her intention of joining the Psychical Society, and Washington prepared a long letter to Mrs. Myers and Podmore on the subject of the permanence of sanguinous stains when connected with crime. That night, all doubts about the objective existence of phantasmata were removed for ever. The day had been warm and sunny, and in the cool of the evening the whole family went out to drive. They did not return home till nine o'clock, when they had a light supper. The conversation in no way turned upon ghosts, so there were not even those primary conditions of receptive expectations which so often precede the presentation of psychical phenomena. The subjects discussed, as I have since learned from Mr. Otis, were merely such as form the ordinary conversation of cultured Americans of the better class, such as the immense superiority of Miss Fanny Devonport over Sarah Bernhardt as an actress, the difficulty of obtaining green corn, buckwheat cakes, and hominy, even in the best English houses, the importance of Boston in the development of the world soul, the advantages of the baggage check system in railway traveling, and the sweetness of the New York accent as compared to the London drawl. No mention at all was made of the supernatural, nor of Sir Simon de Canterville alluded to in any way. At eleven o'clock the family retired, and by half-past all the lights were out. Some time after Mr. Otis was awakened by a curious noise in the corridor outside his room. It sounded like the clank of metal, and seemed to be coming nearer every moment. He got up at once, struck a match, and looked at the time. It was exactly one o'clock. He was quite calm and felt his pulse, which was not at all feverish. The strange noise still continued, and with it he heard distinctly the sound of footsteps. He put on his slippers, took a small oblong file out of his dressing case, and opened the door. Right in front of him he saw, in the wan moonlight, an old man of terrible aspect. His eyes were as red burning coals. Long gray hair fell over his shoulders in matted coils. His garments, which were of antique cut, were soiled and ragged, and from his wrists and ankles hung heavy manacles and rusty gyves. "'My dear sir,' said Mr. Otis, "'I really must insist on your oiling those chains, and have brought you for that purpose a small bottle of the Tammany Rising Sun Lubricator. It is said to be completely efficacious upon one application, and there are several testimonials to that effect on the wrapper from some of our most eminent native divines. I shall leave it here for you by the bedroom candles, and will be happy to supply you with more should you require it. With these words the United States Minister laid the bottle down on a marble table, and, closing his door, retired to rest. For a moment the Canterville ghost stood quite motionless in natural indignation, then, dashing the bottle violently upon the polished floor, he fled down the corridor, uttering hollow groans and emitting a ghastly green light. 
Just, however, as he reached the top of the great oak staircase, a door was flung open. Two little white-robed figures appeared, and a large pillow whizzed past his head. There was evidently no time to be lost. So, hastily adopting the fourth dimension of space as a means of escape, he vanished through the wainscoting, and the house became quite quiet. On reaching a small secret chamber in the left wing, he leaned up against a moonbeam to recover his breath, and began to try and realize his position. Never, in a brilliant and uninterrupted career of three hundred years, had he been so grossly insulted. He thought of the dowager duchess, whom he had frightened into a fit as she stood before the glass in her lace and diamonds, of the four housemaids who had gone into hysterics when he merely grinned at them through the curtains on one of the spare bedrooms, of the rector of the parish, whose candle he had blown out as he was coming late one night from the library, and who had been under the care of Sir William Gull ever since, a perfect martyr to nervous disorders, and of old Madame de Tremouliac, who, having wakened up one morning early, and seen a skeleton seated in an armchair by the fire reading her diary, had been confined to her bed for six weeks with an attack of brain fever, and on her recovery had become reconciled to the church, and broken off her connection with that notorious skeptic, Monsieur de Voltaire. He remembered the terrible night when the wicked Lord Canterville was found choking in his dressing-room with a knave of diamonds halfway down his throat, and confessed, just before he died, that he had cheated Charles James Fox out of fifty thousand pounds at Crockford's by means of that very card, and swore that the ghost had made him to swallow it. All his great achievements came back to him again from the butler who had shot himself in the pantry, because he had seen a green hand tapping at the window-pane, to the beautiful Lady Stutfield, who was always obliged to wear a black velvet band round her throat, to hide the mark of five fingers burnt upon her white skin, and who drowned herself at last in the carp-pond at the end of the King's Walk. With the enthusiastic egotism of the true artist, he went over his most celebrated performances, and smiled bitterly to himself as he recalled to his mind his last appearance as Red Reuben or the Strangled Babe, his debut as Gaunt Gibeon, the Bloodsucker of Bexley Moor, and the furor he had excited one lovely June evening by merely playing ninepins with his own bones upon the lawn-tennis ground. And, after all this, some wretched modern Americans were to come and offer him the Rising Sun Lubricator, and throw pillows at his head? It was quite unbearable. Besides, no ghost in history had ever been treated in this manner. Accordingly, he determined to have vengeance, and remained till daylight in an attitude of deep thought. End of chapter 2